my last opportunity to praise the Lord. And so today I will give him everything I have. Let the Bible voice back my hand. So 
miracles in this church, and God's not finished. Amen? But I do, um, today, as far as announcement goes, our district conference is in Columbus, Indiana, August 6th and 7th. If you would like to go to that, I think Pastor has asked us all just to watch it online. Um, also today, we're going to take our Mother's Memorial Offering. Our offering is due this week, and we kind of relaxed on it this year just to kind of give everybody a break. But I know that we can give a great offering. Mother's Memorial supports so many wonderful things. Two of those children's mansion, new beginnings, missionaries. And so this year, I want us to focus on our foreign Bible school students. For $200, you can support a foreign Bible school student. If you go to college in the United States, you're spending thousands. But in a foreign country, we can send one student for $200 for the entire year. And then they are going back to their country and preaching the gospel in their own language to people that they know. And we are training them to do that. And so if you are able, I would like for each family in this church to give $200 if you're able. If you're not, please give what you're able to give. And uh, please mark that as Mother's Memorial. And that is going to go this week. So anytime this week that you can give that in, we would appreciate that.
We're going to continue having our ushers put the offering pans up here until we feel like it's safe to do otherwise. And then as they play and sing this morning, come and bring your tithes, bring your offerings, and, and put them in and continue to worship the Lord this morning. Brother Barley, please pray for our offering today.
and I was immediately impressed by both of them. And uh, I got to hear Sister Guyan play and sing, and I was like, wow, she's got an ability and a talent. We're so thankful for that. Amen. Aren't you blessed by their music this morning? This is their son on the bass guitar. In case you didn't know, it's their nephew on the drums, but you already know. Him, so. We're so thankful that Brother Guy brings his entire family when he comes. So I think Winston was singing and Grant was playing. And, uh, you know, when I was their age, we didn't look like men, we looked like little boys. And now they come and they're 16 and they, they look like, you look older than me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that's not what go with me, but uh, I'm so thankful that they come and bless us. And so um, the, the first couple of times that they came, we weren't here, and they were coming to, and to help us while we were out of town for different reasons. And so the fact that we were going to be here was a little bit of a shock. And so I'm glad that we got to actually be here when they were here. I want us to do something this morning. Sometimes we allow the fact that so many people are absent affect us. And I want to have church no matter what's going on in the world. I want to have church no matter what's going on in the world. So let's get behind the preacher today, clap our hands, say it again, say hallelujah. And let's let the Lord speak to our hearts. Because when we come and worship him, and when we hear his word, we can leave here differently than we arrived. Amen. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise for the God. Praise the Lord, everybody. God is good. Amen. Amen. So good to be here in Mary, Indiana. And uh, we give honor to Pastor and Sister Williams, their wonderful children, Anna and Jacob. And it is a, a distinct privilege to be here with them. I, I was trying to count up how many times. I don't really remember how many times we've been here, but it's always been cold. I know that. <laughs> so it's, I think it's been the winter time. And, uh, but each time uh, the Williams were out here, and uh, they were always so kind and, and communicating so well. And, uh, but it's good to, to be here with them. Amen. It's good to be here with you all. I know that this has been uh, some changes since we last met. Changes in all of our lives. And, uh, and getting back together actual physical service uh, is always such a refreshing thing. I, I enjoyed online church. Anybody else enjoy online church? Uh, we have online church. We, we tried online church. and uh, The first Sunday that we had online church, we uh, we got dressed in our suits. And, uh, we speak boys a bit. And uh, my wife put her Sunday on, dress on, and we came downstairs and well, we plugged in the computer. We got it all ready to go. And uh, it, it was it was great for what it was, amen, and uh, we enjoyed it, but there was something a little awkward about just shouting amen when the preacher said something, I, I just felt a little, about anybody else with me, and, uh, and, and then just lifting your hands and praying, uh, I found myself kind of opening my eyes, making sure the boys were praying, and I didn't see if I wanted to pray, sometimes they were really quiet, and uh, it made me realize a couple things, There, there is a beautiful Anonymity when you're kind of in a sanctuary full of people and everybody starts to pray and everybody starts to worship that you can kind of call upon the name of Jesus and not feel like that man everybody just heard me. Uh, the next thing I'm about to say is really personal, Lord. I don't want anybody else to hear me, so I'm going to pray internally. But isn't it glad? Aren't you glad you can come together today in the middle of the worship service? And In our living rooms, and we felt them even in the car. Some of us were driving on the road and watching services. I'm guilty of that, or listening to services rather. And, and, but we feel God's presence when we gather together and we call upon that name that is above every name, the name of Jesus. Amen. And so we're thankful for the technology. But I feel that we just need to be really thankful for just coming together and encouraging one another. I know we can't shake hands, it's already been stated, hug each other's neck. But you know what? You can say, God bless you. Yeah. God bless you. I'm praying for you. Yeah. And that connection means more than some of us will ever know. Yeah. 
Because there's been times where I've felt a little down, felt a little heavy, circumstances of life. Somebody just looked at me and crossed that aisle and said, hey, pray for me. Yeah. You know what? That made me feel that hope, that blessed assurance yeah. that God is going to make a way. Hallelujah. Amen. And so we're thankful for that. Having said all that, sometimes we have to retrain ourselves. Amen. And uh, I had to do this a couple times. I came back to church and we all gathered together. I was still stuck in my living room. And uh, or I would say my mind. Yeah. Somebody get up and say I'm not loving. Felt good. I never retrain us. Because you know what I would say if I was in service? Amen. Preach it. Come on now. Somebody say something. Oh, hallelujah. Come on. I feel the presence of the Lord. Jesus, but he also saw that his own people would reject him, 
And so Matthew, in the beginning pages of one and one, was trying to thread this royal ruby scarlet thread from the Old Testament to the New Testament. And the writer of Matthew does that very well. We see this thread, this thread called the blood. It was woven through the genealogy of Christ. That thread goes to many different uh, dynamics of the social or the, the human endeavor, such as the dynamics of social status and the dynamics of royalty. We find that that thread was woven through the homespun fabric of a slave in Egypt. We find that that thread was also woven into a royal robe in a priestly palace. We find that thread was never broken nor never dropped. We find that thread was woven into the outcast of society such as prostitutes or, or people that would operate under the skies of night. We find that royal thread of scarlet royalty was woven into every fabric of society, even fabrics that we can see today in modern day America. You see, God did not drop that fabric. That fabric was not broken. That thread was not severed. But God was tracing his genealogy in Matthew 1 and 1 to every walk of life. That tells me that this thing called the blood is important. This bloodline is very important. The Jews must understand. The Gentiles must understand that God is no respecter of people. He does not care where you came from or what past that you have behind you. But what he does care about is that he cares about where you're going and your future. God is telling us in Matthew 1 and 1 that it does not an optional article of faith. It is essential to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Right. If Jesus was not virgin born, then he had a human father. If he had a human father, then he was not God. Right. If he was not God, the Bible is false. Right. Jesus himself is deluded. And we have no adequate savior from our sins. Right. If Jesus was not God manifested in the flesh, the life that was surrendered on the cross was only human life and could never take away the sin of the world. As man, he could only give a life for a life. But as God, he could lay down an infinite life that was more than sufficient to redeem any number of lives. They shall call his name Emmanuel, Matthew quoted, which is God with us. Ladies and gentlemen, that should settle the debate that there is only one Lord and one faith and one baptism. That should settle any stronger that would claim that there is more than one in heaven. Because it was that life that redeemed us by our sins, from our sins. It was that life, that blood that was shed, that washed away our sins and made us a new creature in Christ Jesus. It was the virgin birth of Christ. Yeah. You see, that blood is powerful. Somebody say amen. amen. That blood is more powerful than any sin. That blood is more powerful than any demonic force. That blood is more powerful than any political agenda. That blood is the most powerful thing in the world. And that blood equates to a bloodline. Now hear me. That bloodline, that bloodline is pure. That bloodline is unbroken. That bloodline is significant for the Gentile believer. Because that bloodline of Christ connects you and I to him. Hallelujah. That means when we are baptized in the name of Jesus and we are filled with the gift of the Holy Ghost by the evidence of speaking in tongues, we are engrafted into his family. That's why we call one another brother and sister. That's why we want to hug each other and tell each other we love. Why? Because you're not just a friend. You're not just somebody in my community, but you are a brother and a sister in Christ. And that means that we have a common father. And he is the father of all things. And he sits on a throne. And he rules the world. That's who our father is. Amen. But how many times do the enemy come against us? He tries to tell us that you're not who you think you are. You're insignificant. 
You don't have a lineage or a DNA. You don't have any claim or right. How many times has the enemy told you that? You wake up and you had a bad week. And maybe a mistake was made. Maybe you stumbled a little bit. You thought, man, I can't do this any longer. And the enemy tried to tell you, I told you so. You just give up. You just, just walk away from this. It's too difficult. There's too many restrictions and guidelines. Requesting, wondering, how am I going to become a better Christian? How can I live my life as an apostolic? Oh, but hear me. You've got a DNA. You've got a lineage. <laughs> oh, your lineage is not your alcoholic father or grandfather. It's not your grandmother that, that did unspeakable things. But your lineage is traced back to a spiritual lineage. Come on, your lineage goes all the way back to Genesis 12. When God told Abraham to get out and be away. When God began to speak to these patriarchs, and your lineage is traced to that lineage of royalty to David and, and to Solomon. Your lineage is traced now to the New Testament, and you come from a long line of preachers. Don't tell me you're not a preacher because you've got a message. You, you've got a word from God. You may never stand behind a pulpit and actually preach a message, but oh, you come from a long line of preachers. You've got a man by the name of Matthew who wrote this very book we're reading from, and, and you've got a man by the name of Paul and, and the Apostle Peter that preached the greatest the world has ever heard. Why? That is your lineage. You have a long line of preachers in your lineage. That means when you get on your job, you're not just there to work. Click in and click out and get that paycheck on Friday. But you're there. There's something inside of you that you cannot get away from. You see, it's an identity that's trying to get out. You, you're a preacher. You're a preacher. You've got a message from God. You know what I believe? I believe that every one of us are, are called to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. I believe that lineage, that lineage, that blood that God shed for you and I causes us to connect to something that is beyond even our imagination or dreams that we can comprehend. God has called us to minister the gospel of Jesus Christ to a world that is lost and dying and on their way to hell. If ever there was an hour where we need the pew, we need the saints of God to stand up and minister to the needs of the world, it's today. We don't need another politician. We don't need a political agenda. We need the church to minister the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's in your lineage. It's in your lineage. You know what? You're a Bible study teacher. You're you're a theologian. You, you're a worship leader. You, you may not have accepted a call. And, and you may not even feel that you're qualified. But all I'm here to say, you've got, a, you've got a word from God. That word is your testimony. How God brought you up and brought you out. I don't know of anybody that was born a saint. I don't know of anybody that was born perfect. But I know of everyone that was born a sinner. And we have been saved by the grace of God. Mercy has been extended to us, and God has called us to reach those that are nearest to us, that need us to be the minister in their life. Yeah. The sad thing is, is that some people will never darken the doors of the church, but that does not mean that they cannot hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. You see, your testimony is the greatest evidence that God is real. What he did for you. Yeah. You may not be able to quote the entire book of Acts. You don't even need to. You only need to be able to quote one verse. Repent and be baptized. That's it. We got that one down. I'm pretty sure we could probably write 238 down in our school. We could probably write it frontwards and backwards. We got it. You don't have to understand all the nuances of 238 of Acts. All you have to do is say, listen, this is what happened to me. You see, I went down to an altar, yes. and I repented of my sins. What kind of sins? Well, you don't even want to know what kind of sins I repented of. Oh, come on, now tell me a little bit. Well, well if, I, if I tell you, you have to know that's who I used to be. 
And that's what God saved you from. Ladies and gentlemen, you don't need to be embarrassed by what God brought you out of. You don't need to be embarrassed what God saved you from. You see, that is a testimony that the devil cannot take away from you. That's something that God brought me. He brought me a long way. Some of us longer than others and further than others. But thank God that he did. Now I've got a word for you that if God can do it for me, he can do it for you. And he can do it for you. You know what I like to see? I like to see on my job.
and we're going to put into the Swanson River, and we're going to canoe down, and we're going to go and lose them. And while we're walking down that road, he starts to quote Robert Service. How many have ever heard of Robert Service? He was a Yukon poet from Great Britain. You haven't heard of Robert Service? My goodness, I need to educate you on Robert Service. He's one of my favorite poets. He's, he's a, he, he wrote poems like The Shooting of Sam McGrew. Anybody ever heard of that? The Cremation of Sam McGee. Anybody ever heard of the Cremation of Sam McGee? Yeah. Okay. Why don't you look that up? It's, it's good stuff. It make you laugh. You know. How about the, uh, the whisper of the little voices? The tall pines. Anybody ever heard of that? Oh my goodness. It, it'll, it'll stir your blood. It'll make you want to go find a wild place in the middle of nowhere and just become a trapper. At least that's what it did for me. And we're working our way down that road and, and I'm carrying this canoe. I don't know if you've ever done anything where the pain in your back and shoulders and the strap is getting into your hips and the only thing that you can think about is I want to get this canoe off my head. And I, I just want to go home and sleep in a comfortable bed. That's all that you can think about. And my cousin starts citing poetry. And he went from Robert Service to Longfellow. And then he made his way around on that beautiful stretch of where two paths meet. And uh, as I'm walking and, and trying to look up at the stars, and, and the sun is starting to come up, and, and he's citing that poetry, it began to stir something inside of me. I, I, I'm not too uh, ashamed to admit, man, I felt, I, felt, I felt some goosebumps on the back of my neck, and I just thought, man, what a setting. Here I am in the middle of the wilderness, walking with a canoe and listening to this this poetry, this, this is unreal. And it stirred me. And it affected me for that moment. But let me tell you something that has affected me for eternity. Something that stirred me when I was 12 years of age in an altar of repentance. Something that moved me into a presence that I thought that I would never feel. But yet there it was, enveloping me, almost overwhelming me. Tears begin to flow down my face, and I couldn't even control my hands. And I definitely couldn't control my tongue. Because what I only knew was one language, but here I was speaking in another language fluently as the Spirit of God gave the utterance. You see, it wasn't poetry that affected my life. It's the Word of God that has the ability to change us and turn us around.
But certainly, it is this mysterious link which unites these apparently dissimilar things together so that the soul can inhabit the body and that life can rest in the blood. Think about that. Life is given to us by the blood of Jesus Christ. I don't know if I'm preaching to anybody here today outside of myself. But I remember those moments where I thought, what, what use is my life? What use is my life to? Not even the kingdom of God, but just to the world in general. What difference can I make, if any, in being hopelessly, hopelessly persuaded that there was nothing that I could contribute because I didn't have the ability or the intellect. I didn't have the backing. I didn't have the finances. I didn't have the opportunities. But oh, something changed the way I look at it when God introduced me to his blood. Something became disturbed inside of my heart and my spirit. And those things that I thought that I needed to possess, I realized that I didn't need anything but him. Right, right. The impact that I wanted to make, it held in comparison to the impact that God was asking me to make. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, we can make an impact in the people that are closest to us by simply telling them about the love of Jesus Christ. Your potential, your potential is only limited by what you fail to give him. If you give him everything, and that's all that he's asking, God has the ability to use your potential to accomplish incredible things in the kingdom of God. This church, revival. This church has never seen revival that God can pour out. Right, right, amen. amen. Six, seven hundred, oh, those are small numbers compared right. to what God can do in right. this church. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. You're going to have to build those, those pews up, up on the walls again like you had a few years back. Yeah. Bust out a couple walls and go ahead and build that building behind the, behind the gymnasium, whatever the plan said. Because revival cannot be contained in four walls right. if this church could understand the ability that it possesses yeah. through the power of Jesus Christ. Yeah. You see, it's not limited by man's imagination. Right. And it's not limited by what we don't have right here and right now. But it's limitless. Why? Because the blood has connected us to something far greater than what we can even imagine. It's the potential that God has given us. Revival belongs to the church, ladies and gentlemen. That's what the Word of God says. Revival is ours to attain. God, when He called Abraham out of darkness and said, Abraham, I want you to get out of this land and go to a promised land. Go to a place that I've given you. And God told him that he was going to bless him. And a sevenfold promise was given to Abraham. That blessing, that promise to Abraham now comes to life in the New Testament of this lineage that God gives us in Matthew. And that lineage is our lineage. Amen. That means that every promise in God's word belongs to you. Right. Every promise. It's not for someone else. It's not for a far off people. It's your promise. That's why when you read the scripture, you read it not in third part, but you read it as if God is speaking directly from its pages to you. That's your promise. That's why we don't hope. We don't hope for healing. We know that God can heal. We don't hope for blessings. We know that God will and can bless. When we read this, we understand that God has the potential to do everything that he said that he can do. How many see a miracle in how many have ever prayed a prayer and God has answered that prayer? Look around. How many times did, did you have bills to pay and didn't know how to pay? And you prayed and God answered that prayer by paying that bill. Anybody? Amen. You're looking at your bank account and there's nothing there. You're thinking, God, I don't know. And, and all of a sudden it just happens. Right. And how many have ever been in desperate, desperation in the middle of the night and you needed a miracle, you needed God to touch you, and you're pacing the floor back and forth saying, God, we need 
We need your touch. And how many have ever pled the blood of Jesus over a child or, or a sick one in your house? I plead the blood of Jesus over this. Anybody ever done that? And how many times God has answered that prayer? Has God ever answered that prayer? You know what that means, ladies and gentlemen? That this just isn't an archaic book that happened thousands of years ago. But the blood of Jesus Christ has brought this word to life. And it is living through you. You are a living testament of God's miraculous work. You are a child of the King of Kings. Amen. This my offer. I don't know if we have it. Let's just stand up. This is it. This understanding that, that God has connected us to something far greater. Sometimes I even understand. I can't tell you how many phone calls my wife and I have filled in the last few months. The position that we serve in currently at IBC, those students have made a connection with us. And throughout the school year, even though they went home, uh, they were still actively enrolled in IBC. They have a pastor, every one of them connected with the pastor. But as a campus pastor, they feel like it's sometimes a little more accessible. I don't know why they feel that. But they just start calling me. I can't tell you how many times late, late at night I wanted to pick up that phone and be a young teenage girl 20, 20 years of age. I can't sleep. Anxiety. Fear. This pandemic had messed with a lot of people. It kind of pushed us a place where we, we didn't know what was going to happen. How, how many just felt like that this could be it? This is over. There's many times I kept thinking, okay, God, when's, when's it happen? I didn't hear that trumpet this morning. I'm sure it's going to happen this afternoon. There was no explanation. It just seemed as if fear and anxiety. A couple young men called me, going, yeah, I'm, I'm fighting battles I've never fought in my life. You know what the enemy would love for the church to do? To be pushed off course. The enemy would love for you and I to get to a place where we fail to see God's purpose in our life. The pandemic has changed the way we operate. There's still people that are at home who haven't even gotten out to come to church. Can you imagine where they're at? Can you imagine what the enemy is doing in their mind? They would love to be here worshiping, lifting up. But no doubt the enemy has come against us over and over again. Some of us in this room, it, it, it's been a while since we just released that fear and embraced peace. I hope that today, today you get an idea of who you are. Yes. You're a child of King. There's royalty in your life. You've been adopted into the faith. That's why you say, out of God, he's your dad. His blood has connected you. His blood has hallowed you. His blood can minister to the needs of people that you come in contact with. Walked into a little shop yesterday afternoon. I'd, I'd never been in a shop before. And uh, just walked in. And, you know, the lady that was there, she was very calm. She was so talkative that I was trying to look at a few things and, and uh, I felt guilty to look at stuff because she would want to talk about everything. She would want to talk about politics. She would want to talk about the state of the world. I was just I was trying to be kind to her. I want to talk. I want to look at things. Talk to her a little bit. Come to find out, she's in chat. Uh, they're in Indianapolis. I realized very quickly that she wasn't doing so good spiritually, and this isn't a slam to her any organization that she's connected with. But the more she began to express, the more I realized that she is she's very pure. She doesn't know what the future is. So she didn't know how to get this. She's worried because she's got health issues already, and if she gets this disease, she doesn't feel that she'll be able to pull through. Her husband, and then a friend of hers, she was telling me he, he's, he's already. And with one leg amputated, he, and she's afraid he's not going to 
make it through this. All and all, she just keeps talking about it. I begin to realize that there's a lot of fear. Yeah. I felt like I needed to remind her I was not a pastor, I'm not a pastor, but I just felt something inside of me. How many of you ever felt that boldness and you're like, I don't know why I'm saying this, but I probably shouldn't say this, but I'm just going to say this to anybody. Anybody felt that? Oh, Jesus, thank I said, you know what, I'm a believer. This is the greatest time that we could ever meet. Because God set us up for the rapture. Yeah. I don't know if she even liked that answer. She, I think it bothered her even more. But oh, ladies and gentlemen, there should be no fear. <laughs> there should be no fear. Because God has given us his answer right here. Come on, we've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. We're wrapped for ready. We should be wrapped for ready. And if you're not, today can be your day. Right where you stand. God can refill you with the gift of the Holy Ghost. God can confirm in your spirit that everything is going to be okay. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what COVID does. It doesn't matter what political unrest does. God is still in control. Come on, God has got an answer for you, and God's got an answer for your friends. Why don't you right now just lift your hands up all across the sanctuary? I want us in the name of Jesus just to call out upon his name. I want us right now just to say, Lord, I need you. I need you to push away any anxiety and fear. God, I need you to give confirmation of who we are. I know I'm your child. I know you saved me by your grace, but God, there's time.
Exodus. And you can see it run through Exodus and Leviticus and it runs all the way down to Zechariah and Malachi. And we see it enter into the New Testament. And there's no place that the blood is more obvious than in the book of John. But then when you get to the end of the book of the New Testament, you see the book of Revelation. And you see the blood so powerfully applied to the church, to you and to me. And it doesn't just suddenly appear in Calvary. You heard him say this morning, the blood runs all the way from the beginning of the book, all the way to the end of the book. And without the blood of Jesus, there is no cleansing from sin. And without the blood, there is no life. I want the blood applied to my life today. Ha, ha, ha. 